Good morning, Conway Cougars and my Jedis. Today we are reading chapter 11 of Small Spaces. The last thing before sixth grade went home was to stand in line to have their picture taken in the middle of a group of three scarecrows. Ollie lined up with everyone else, but she was almost bouncing with impatience. She wanted so badly to read, it felt like her book was burning a hole in her backpack. Mr. Easton looked happy. The sun was vivid now. The clouds had all burned away. They had spent the whole day at the farm, and except for Coco's chin, the trip had went pretty well. The bus driver was still hanging around. He eyed the sixth grade as though they were picking out which chicken to chop for dinner, Ollie thought. Mr. Easton tried to make small talk. A lot of scarecrows you've got here, he said. Where'd you find the time to make so many? Ollie hadn't thought of that. She wondered if there were farmers they hadn't seen. How many people did it take to run a farm? They were here already, said the bus driver. The, the scarecrows, said Mr. Easton. Where'd they come from? Here, the bus driver again, all here. Now he was looking over Mr. Easton's shoulder straight at Ollie. She wanted to sleek away, eyes open, just ready to be stood up. Mr. Easton looked interested. They're in such good condition, he said. I wonder how old they are. The bus driver just shrugged and smiled. He was still looking at Ollie. Old enough, he said. Old enough. The clouds were filling in as the sun slanted west. Twilight had arrived by the time the sixth grade piled into the steamy bus. There was much less noise in that morning. Lunch and horses, milking cows and photos had worn them out. It was good to meet you, Olivia, Seth said. You too, said Ollie. She didn't even correct him when he called her Olivia. She thought of telling him everything, asking him if he knew that Mrs. Webster was, af what, was what Mrs. Webster was afraid of. Mr. Seth, she began. But Mr. Easton broke in. On the bus, he called. Hurry up. Got to get to school by pickup time. Ollie hesitated, torn, and then Seth had already turned towards the main barn, whistling again. He gave Ollie a last thoughtful glance over his shoulder. Ollie climbed onto the bus. Miss Webster watched them go from the gra gravel driveway as the sun hid behind the clouds and the cherry expression seemed to leach out at her face, leaving it gray and old, exhausted. She looked like she had just been crying by the creek, except this time her eyes were dry, her face hard. The black cat, his name is Bellamuth, Seth had told her when Ollie asked, making her laugh, sat behind Miss Webster. His tail curled neatly around her his feet, his eyes bright in the gathering dusk. Ollie sank down in her seat, ready to get home to the egg. Hopefully dad was making something yummy, lasagna or his famous cornbread mold squash pot pie. Ollie, to make up for yesterday, would eat every bite. Then she would finish small spaces downstairs by the wood stove with a mug of hot chocolate. Once she finished, she would tell her dad about the farm mystery. He would be intrigued. They would pass theories back and forth. She would even laugh at his jokes. Coco Zittner kept trying to apologize. Ollie ignored her. Coco tried one last time on the bus. Hey, Ollie, she said. Ollie, I... Ollie tried at the end... Ollie tired at the end of her temper, was about to say something she would have regretted, but Mr. Easton saved her. Come on, he called. Get in your seats, all of you. We're moving out. Coco sat down looking unhappy. The engine roared. The bus started off. Ollie took the seat next to Brian again. She wondered what Brian, who quoted Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, would think about the mystery of the misty valley and the small spaces. She didn't know what to think of it herself. She opened her book. Three nights later, Jonathan disappeared. He had made a will. The farm was mine for a lifetime and our children's after I was gone. The farm I now leave to you, Margaret, Margaret, my dearest daughter. He also left me a letter. Don't try to find me, he wrote. I love you. I'm sorry. But we searched. Of course we searched. We found nothing. A week after his brother's disappearance, Caleb came to me. I know where John is, he said. I know what you're thinking, I said, but the smiling man isn't real. John just made him up. He was frightened and he felt guilty and made him up. But even as I said it, I didn't believe it. And Caleb knew I didn't. The smiling man pulled me out of the river, said Caleb. I can't catch anything else from that night. But I remember his hands on me and mine were blue. Caleb paused. Jonathan's not gone, you know. At night, I can hear his footsteps, Caleb swallowed. I go to him. I go to where he is so John won't be alone. 
I shouldn't have said it, my dearest Margaret. I shouldn't have, but I did. Go to them then, madman, I spat. If you think you can, don't come back. It's your fault he is gone. Caleb wasn't angry. He stood silent a moment. Then he bent and whispered in my ear, until the mist becomes rain. Then he was gone. I never saw Caleb or Jonathan again. Something changed in the quality of the noise on the bus. Ollie looked up from her book, frowning. The shouting had dropped, and even the mononotorious, mononotorious urging from Mr. Easton to sit down, please, and be quiet seemed different. Distracted. Puzzled. Ollie looked out the window, peering around Brian. A heavy fog had descended on the road, the black tops of trees poking up like downing fingers. The left side of the road was forest, and on the right side, the cornfield stretched out, guarded by scowling scarecrows. The mist was so dense that it threw the headlights back into their eyes. The bus was rolling along at a crawl. Ollie's hands tightened involuntarily around the book. There were murder, mutters all around, nervous giggling. So weird. Look at the fall. fog. I have to pee. The bus was crawling slower and slower. The mist thickened. Ollie didn't rec recognize where they were. She didn't even know how long they'd been driving. She stared out the window when the mist rises. But the year wasn't turning. Also, her book was just a story. They drifted to a halt. The bus coughed and died. For a moment, total silence. Then a burst of noise. I think the bus broke down. I want to go home. We're lost, yelled Mike Camel, even though that was stupid. How could they be lost? Ollie was still staring out the window. The yellow autumn trees had turned black and spinely as though winter had come in the last three minutes. The broad, smooth country road had become an old, cracked ribbon, running away and vanishing into the trees, still lapped in the mist. Where were they? Slowly, the bus driver stood up. The shouting died away. The driver turned around. He seemed to have gotten both taller and wider. Well, said the driver, surveying the mist. Surveying them. Best get moving. At nightfall, they'll come for the rest of you. Then he smiled, tongue flickering red against his teeth. <gasps> okay, Jedis and Conway Cougars, that is the end of chapter 11. As I was reading that last chapter, I couldn't help but stare at the picture of the cover of the book and think, was that what Ollie was seeing? So tune in tomorrow for chapter 12. Have a great day, everyone.